to the guys from last year. I mean, I was mesmerized. So, Randy, you want to take this talk and then introduce Jim? Yeah. So, Jim, come on up, just so they know who you are. So, we're going to do this kind of tag team style. I'm going to start off and kind of talk about how Baldwin defined its paint schemes in the later years. Jim's going to step in and tell you whenever I'm wrong. Um, frequently, probably. And then we're going to go um, work our way through that, and then Jim's going to talk about, try to place these schemes in in the grand scheme of decoration. Why, why did they bother to, to use these? So here we are. We're going to be talking about basically the, the last of the Bonanza engines. And that's kind of important, and they, they happen in a really important time in Baldwin's history when Baldwin's changing. Let's see if I've got which one. Right one. Yeah. The oh, there it is. We found one. No, that was the wrong one. Okay, there. Oh, uh, oh. can we? Yeah. Just follow the instructions. Yeah, come on. Who wants to make something happen? <laughs> 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 no, no, okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. They have a button, but you don't use the button. Um, okay, so we're talking about Mobile's Truckee, Tahoe. We're talking about the Bowker and Yo, and then two more Mobile's. Um, all by Baldwin. All coming as Baldwin is starting to mature. Uh, they're the last of the Bonanza engines. They're not going to get new engines until essentially the turn of the century. Um, they're all constructed under the modern class system for Baldwin, which wasn't very modern. Um, they're painted in the new Baldwin standard paint system. Um, they're last named engines on the railroad. So we're seeing the last of the glory engines. Um, three of them survived. Um, so, history of the works. This is Baldwin's corporate history. With a complete organization, the most modern equipment, and with ample room for future expansion, the Baldwin Locomotive Works are fully prepared to meet any demands, I can't type either, either domestic or foreign, which may be made upon them. And they were essentially the largest locomotive builder in the world at this moment. Um, so, we've got some things. This is 74, 75, the class system and the paint system. So, Baldwin has been growing. Um, and they're having to reorganize how they do things so that they can manage an organization that will ultimately build as many as 2,000 locomotives in a year. Um, so, first of all, these are not 260s, 440s, 240s as defined by the White System, because the White System doesn't exist. Baldwin started building locomotives in the 1830s, and they had to figure out how to call their locomotives, and nobody had come up with this simple system. So we start looking, and Comstock, for example, was a 27 and a half D in the original Baldwin system, while Empire and Esmeralda were 826 Ds. That's the new class system. Um, Truckee, Tahoe, Merrimack were larger 628Ds. And so we'll talk about what that means and how that came about. Uh, Reno was a 27.5C, while uh, essentially identical uh, Genoa and Inyo are 826Cs. James and Bowker. Um, so Baldwin gets started in a time when most locomotives had one driving axle. Um, and then some of them had lead wheels, and, and then some of them, the lead wheels were rigid, and then they went to two driving axles, and finally added three. And so Baldwin, not having figured out that you could use the white system, created a system where a one-drivered engine was either an A or a B, a two-driver, a two-driving axle engine was a uh, C, a three-driving axle engine was a D, and a four driving axle engine was an E. And we get that carried through, but as we get to 1870s, they now need to add some other information because things are getting more complicated. Um, occasionally we have trailing axles, we have size issues that we need to talk about. Um, so we get out of the Baldwin law books, and 
and these are one of the documents Baldwin uses. They, they have a set of books called law books. They have junior law books, and these are how they tell people what they should do. And basic information, like defining screw thread is in there. Uh, basic information like the, the rivet pattern on a boiler is in this book. <laughs> Anytime they have a question that needs to be defined so that this working force which at the time of the construction of these engines was a bit over 1,400 people. It had been 3,000 three years before. We're in the middle of a depression when these engines are built. They're having to tell, they're trying to create these new things. So the law book comes up, and our 826C76, which is in you, has eight wheels. It has 16 inch diameter cylinders. We get that from this table from the law book. And it, yeah. okay, I can go back up. I can go backwards. Um, and then it has four driving wheels with the C, and 78 means it's the 78th engine of this class built. And they are including the earlier engines. Um, so this is the new class system. And they're going to drive a lot of things off the class system. Okay, so kind of looking at the production, this is going to tell us why they had to do it. They start off in 1832 with one locomotive, 33 is a big year, they don't build anything. 34, they're at four. Well, in 1870, there are 280 locomotives. Um, the Depression, we're going to move up to four, over 400 and then it's going to drop down. Uh, by 1900, there are 2,000 locomotives. So this is a company dealing with how do you tell employees what to do. 1876, the year after these engines were built, Baldwin had 1,400 plus employees. 28 of them were painters. We can assume that only five years earlier, 3,000 employees, that they had about 60 painters. How do you communicate to these people what a locomotive should be like? This is too big a job to just wander around the factory floor and say, yeah, let's, let's do something like that. They're going to have to codify everything they do. And they're going to do it through a bunch of documents, and we're really lucky that between a number of archives, the Baldwin documents essentially have survived. Um, we have specification sheets. They, they grow over years. Um, this is the sheet for James. This is the sheet for Valker. And we're getting more information. It's everything from the gauge of the locomotive, um, how the locomotives, what the boiler jacket's made out of. Down here we get into information concerning the appearance of the locomotive. So, back to the law book. This is one of the laws, if you go through, the, one of the law books is at Stanford, the rest are in Texas. Um, you can see that somebody screwed something up kind of explains the law books. It, here we have the name of the engine to go on the panel of the cab, name of the road on the side of the tank, the name to be in full. No R period R, RY period, or RW, <coughs> except where specified. And these are the things that Baldwin's putting out. You know, somebody screwed up and now we have a memo that sets in stone how things will happen. And here we have Bowker, and it is marked V period and T period R period R. So we're gonna see how the specification sheets start to mesh into the law books, and they're gonna start meshing into the entire system. Okay, uh, finished schedules. You don't want to write down what's going to be brass every time you build every single locomotive. So you have a shorthand, you have finished schedules, and they are A through O or R. R is the last one. And for example, C has 90 some variations. Um, so this happens to be the K4, which is what Bowker is built for. And the problem is that right up here we say, well, go first to K1 and see what it says. So we have to go to K1 that has a great deal of information. And K1's from 1873. Um, K4 is from 1874. And we're going to start changing things. We're going to talk about on these, though, 
things like that these are a planished iron jacket. Um, every individual thing, is it painted, is it finished, is it brass, is it steel? And so this is the shorthand, and again, these survive. So we're able to go back and see how it is. And this is actually for a pretty fancy engine. Uh, we've got materials in these engines. They're going to specify a lot of things. So again, this is Bowker. And up above on that, even though it's on the finish schedule, there's Russia iron with brass bands. Um, that miracle material that we keep talking about. Down below, we're going to have things like uh, the number. We're going to have the color that it's painted. Um, although I cut it off on there. It happens to be a wine and um, in style one. Uh, Russia iron. What is this stuff? It's a piece of irons with a metallic coating. I brought a sample. This one we believe is off uh, one of the porters from the San Joaquin Sierra Nevada. It came out of a San Joaquin Sierra Nevada passenger car. Um, off to the side <coughs> is actually a photograph of a sample that I believe actually is in you. Yeah, it's from the India. Yeah, and it in fact is wonderful because it has marked on it that it is in fact Russia iron. So we start to see the materials called out on these things. And we can go back and learn what they are. We can look at samples of Russian iron. They do exist. And we can start to see how these engines actually looked. Okay, so paint colors and striping, uh, they're called out the specification sheets by name. Before the standard system, you'd get something like wine, best finish, best passenger finish, something cryptic. And at that moment, in a time when they weren't making as many locomotives, that probably the foreman would go through and say, we're going to change this now. But there wasn't a lot of, there was more change, but it wasn't as codified. But now we're going to be codified. Locomotives 19 through 22 are all ordered as wine color style one. Locomotives 23 and 24, which are on the same specification as the first two, wine color is lined out, Lincoln Gold is written in. And this is actually a evolution in the system. Wine color here is telling you what the engine will be painted. And they basically mean anything on the engine that's painted is painted that color. The frame is wine color, and wine color is a reference to a single paint color. Um, the drivers are painted wine color. If the cab is painted, it's wine color. The tender is wine color. The, there, there are very few things that are not wine color. Maybe the smoke box is not wine color, okay? Where this, lake and gold, is an evolution because lake and color would be different than lake and gold. Because now we're also specifying that the striping on this engine is gold leaf. And if we use lake and color, that am, the amber stand is very important, we'd be using yellow paint in place of gold leaf. Okay? So we're seeing this continue. So this is literally within a year we've got this change in the Baldwin system as we watch it evolve. Randy? Yes. Can you make a comparison between from wine and lake? Yeah, in a minute. Colors to what today's colors might be. In a minute. Okay. We'll get there. Randy, I have a question. Yes. The law books you referred to, are they online or do you have to visit? They're not online. Stanford has one, and there are law books and junior law books. The remainder are at DeGrolier in Texas. So um, at this point, no, they're not online. Uh, yeah, I just want to point something out about the uh, change to lake color. You know, this is nothing particular to the last two engines on this list. This is just because they were using an older spec sheet, and they simply updated to the current standards. So because Baldwin <coughs> adopted you know, lake color in, in May, June, 1875, all engines <coughs> after that time were automatically lake until they phased that out and all green comes in. So when they had an older spec, and they're simply saying, you know, build some more of these, they simply you know, rub out the obsolete bits and sort of move in the new stuff. So it's written in pencil, you know, lake and gold, indicating that's a new practice. So it's not particular to the VNT and not particular to these mobiles. It just happens to be an update to the current standard. 
So, style book. The style book is actually two books. They're held at Stanford. They're huge. And they were a set of instructions. They were a single handmade set of books. They lived on the paint shop floor. They, they're speckled with paint in these places. Now, you have 28 painters when these engines are built. You've had 30 before. You'll have 90 later. Um, these are very likely, some of these men may not be English speaking. Uh, some of them are not highly literate. So how do you put together a system where you can tell them what to do? Well, they can go, even if they're not completely literate, they're probably able to read basic numbers. And the book starts off with three pages of tables. And, oh, go back there. Oh, we've got too many tools here. Um, you start off with a cab. You have, or actually styles, numbers, cab, which is not used initially. And by the way, we think these books from looking at them probably date from closer to 1880 to 1874. And it has to do, they were probably remade at some point. Um, cylinder, a tank on the boiler, a sandbox, a driver, and a tender tank. And you notice this has got a line through it because style one is not for tank engines. It's for tender engines. And because these are style one engines, the first style, we use no cab because we don't designate cabs. And in fact, style one was generally a varnished cab, so it had its own set of rules. Cylinder, sandbox, driver, and tender tank. So the man can go and say, I need one, 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 one. <coughs> Further down, we get into cylinder one, sandbox three, driver two, tender tank three. We're now expanding the system. So you take that and you go into the books. And here is the first page of cylinders. And we have cylinders one, two, three, four, five, and six. And we're doing style one and it calls for cylinder one. And we go to cylinder one. We'll see it again. And we repeat this process. Sandboxes. Drivers, tanks. Now, when you see this, this doesn't say that that stripe is one inch wide. The painter is expected to look at this and then put a stripe in proportion to the side of the tender, with one exception that we believe that the stencil, oh, yeah, this thing doesn't cause red lights to come out. In the, in the top of it. Yeah, okay. The top oh, okay. Oh, okay. Then I'll, the stencils used here only come in one size. So the stenciling, the arabesques in this case, okay, okay, yeah, are going to be the same throughout the engine. But the painters are skilled individuals. They're considered craftsmen um, on a level with a machinist or a blacksmith. So they're going to be able to take this stuff and translate this into the same appearance on an engine. Okay, so we take for style one, these are the four images that describe style one. So we can take, here's Bowker's Builder's photo. And if we look down here, we see a tender that's looking familiar to us. We just see a little bit of striping here. Okay, well there's the tender, style one, and there it is as it appears on Bowker. And remember that we had instructions that it was to be V and T, R, R, overriding the law book. Okay, we have our finish code that tells us what on this engine is gonna be brass polished, what's going to be painted, what's going to be um, brass nosings, um, so we've got a series of instructions that can be followed by a series of crews throughout the shop who are trimming out and painting an engine. Okay, here we have one of the moguls. Trucky. Okay, so here we have another shot. This is a Watkins photograph, and there on the dome is that. So this is being translated into these engines. 
Uh, one thing, we're only talking about these engines as they came and arrived on the railroad. Within a couple years, these engines are being repainted and repaired, and some details will be lost, and it doesn't happen all at once. It's pretty clear that in a lot of cases, it seems like the dome striping lasts longer than anything else. Okay, so when you look at it, that's one of the things to start looking at. On the other hand, when we look at some of these early photos that we know now are early photos, you can't see all the details that you know should be there based upon the specification sheets. Okay, so what we want to do is try to figure out what colors. Heather, here come the colors. Okay, so in this case, we had a really nice happenstance. Jim's been working on a report for Glenbrook and has had access to some parts. And we can go to Glenbrook, and I'm not gonna, right there it says wine color style one, okay? And there's Glenbrook's headlight. We didn't find any paint on it of significance. Um, they stripped it in 1902. <laughs> <laughs> Jim and I spent two hours sanding out paint looking for things, but they never got the cap step. So this is wine color and a couple of stripes. Um, a sample of wine color that was sent. Explain. Sure, this is a, uh, a piece of, of uh, uh, Glenbrook that was cut out as a uh, preservation. We took this to uh, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and it went into the same laboratories that are familiar with working with Van Gogh Rembrandt, small people like that. And we decided that it would be fun for them to work on a locomotive. And they did a number of tests and they determined uh, the content of the paint and the probable materials that the paint was made out of. They determined that a good deal of it was uh, uh, incredibly toxic and poisonous. <laughs> and this little chart down here, uh, you can sort of see, would you, yeah, right there, that red line is the actual Baldwin color. And those green and blue lines that are coming nowhere near as high are attempts to match up uh, that paint using modern materials. And this original Baldwin paint uh, is just spectacular stuff. It's very hard wearing. And we were able to determine that it is made up of a uh, oxide, an iron oxide metallic paint of some kind, probably Venetian red. And there is uh, the presence of cinnabar indicates uh, the use of vermilion, and actually true vermilion, English vermilion, uh, so that we now are able to reconstruct what wine color was actually made of. And it was made up of something akin to vermilion, which is a bright red, a warm bright red, and um, Indian red, or some kind of uh, reddish brown color. So for anyone <coughs> seeking to reproduce that in various types, there's a, there's a recipe for you. Uh, we also now have a good indication based on this that lake color was made up of Indian red and black. And that when Baldwin shifted to olive green, that was black and yellow ochre. Or chrome yellow. It's a very simple system. This here, this is lake. And no, it's a, that's, a, that's from Tahoe. That's, well, that's, Tahoe. Okay. that's wine sorry, color. Wine color. That's a trace of Tahoe's wheel. Uh, that red piece is the hub. And that's the sunburst that comes out. You can see the gold leaf stripe and then a cream stripe and then the lake ground, which is existed on the edge of this day. So we've got some hints of what these colors probably were. Um, we also go into original paint material. Masary was one of Baldwin's paint suppliers. And Munich Lake, right here, is my guess at what lake was. But we're kind of suspicious. Lake, notice that we've got Munich Lake, we've got Brilliant Lake. Um, they do consider Carmine to be lakes. There's about a dozen different lakes in this paint catalog. Mm -hmm. Because lake is not a color. Lake is a way of making paint. Okay. It was traditionally taking byproducts of dye making, which were generally made from sandalwood, some organic material that had been boiled, and combining it with metal components, things like leads or zincs, to make a paint. And it was a generally a relatively translucent and a pretty expensive paint. Um, kind of fun here. Western red is 70 cents. Perfect blue is two bucks. These are for pound. Green, a buck. 
Munich Lakes for 50. Um, yeah, check out Carmine. It's 11 bucks. Um, Jim mentioned English Vermilion. It doesn't have a price. It's like going to the restaurant and ordering lobster. <laughs> you, if you need to add, know how much it's worth, you don't necessarily want to go. Although it's only one component in that paint. So I've got the original catalog with me. Um, people can catch me later between breaks and we can look at it. Okay. So we also found another evidence point. Because we've been trying to chase these colors. In the paint book were several pages of headlights. But the headlights aren't called out in the tables. And honestly, the first couple times I used the paint books, I never looked at the headlights. I, that's interesting, but they're not called out, so I'm not as worried about them. Until we figured out that the headlights are the Rosetta Stone. <coughs> okay. At the top of each, there's a little statement. And it is wine, color, and gold. They're going to tell us this is how you stripe with those. And we have Baldwin Green, and we have Black, and later they have Tuscan, they have White, they have um, there's a a leather of, color. There's A lot of these are related to uh, steam dyes, which were very colorful. But this becomes our kind of our Rosetta Stone, because in the originals, these are painted with locomotive paint. If someone was going to create a new style, if you've got a little logging railroad somewhere, and you say, I'd like to order one of your engines, but I don't need a fussy, fancy tender. I'd like it to be very special, because that's what I want to project. But I want a simpler tender. They might do a very simple striping pattern on the tender, and that might be the first time it shows up. Um, they will take, and they'll cut out a piece of cardboard that looks like a tender, and they're going to paint it with whatever the standard locomotive paint is, and then they're going to stripe it, and that now becomes the standard. So, just to give everyone hope, <laughs> for those of you who have your early Reno from PFM and you know you're going to have to paint it, and you're worried about the decals, uh, this is a test shot of some decals being created for a narrow gauge project in style one. So the artwork is this far along. It has been, I believe it's been accepted by um, Microscale to publish it. Um, it turned out that it's kind of challenging. Originally, it was going to be done on an Alps, but this can be reworked for other engines and will be reworked for, for a PFM uh, 440. So with that, I'm going to hand this thing off. Okay, so let me show you. That one's forward. That one's backward. Back to get to talking to. I'm talking to this. <laughs> All right, well, uh, that is the nuts and bolts department. That's the how stuff gets made. What I would like to do a little bit is, uh, before we actually go on to the Virginia Truckee engines that are in style one, is give you a little background on primarily like two things. Uh, one is how style one actually developed, because now you know what it is. I'd like to know you, I'd like you to understand how it comes into being and what happens to it. And the other thing that I'd like to tell you is why it matters to us, because I will tell you, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about some curator with one of these museums, I forget who and what and where, just said, well, we thought about restoring it to its you know, original appearance, but it'd be just another style one engine. Now, they said that to me. What they didn't know at that time, when these restorations were going on, and what we know now, is that there is no such thing as just another style one. If you were lucky enough to have the means to have a fleet of Style One locomotives, you were projecting major power. You were projecting a sense of ideals and ability and capacity that most railroads never got near. Just another fleet of Style One engines didn't happen. <coughs> that every single locomotive on all these little small lines buying Baldwins out here in Nevada and California got Style 1. And they didn't get Style 1 for passenger engines, they got it for freight engines and switching engines, baby carriages, wagons, anything that moved. They, they got it in Style 1. And that's extraordinary. It's vitally important and it is a, a 
testimony to not only the comp stuff, but the whole concept of Western boomerism, because style one engines moved grain on the Monterey coast, they you know, moved commuters, they moved gold, they moved silver, they you know, moved just about anything that could go redwood. And that's something that we shouldn't forget, because this is a style that, you, that projects oomph. So let's talk about oomph. This is a good example of oomph. Let's see this. There, that's oomph, right there. That's, that's an 1859 uh, trade advertisement for Baldwin. You have this nice little 10-wheeler, outside frame 10-wheeler, double domes. Baldwin loved double domes. Here's a, uh, a flexible beam freight locomotive that the forward two driving axles slide laterally so the engine can go around curves while maintaining power to them. They sold it a lot. It was a very popular design. But it, all of these engines are innate, but it's this top engine that has the most style because passenger engines projected power and they projected the illusion of safety and comfort and ability to their clients, passengers. And there was many comments in the trade press going like, New York Central decides to paint its engines brown instead of the way it was before. That's, by the way, they went brown, not black. Um, the newspapers wail about how miserable it is and they'll look like those old smoke wagons on the Canadian roads and you know, how terrible things are going to be uh, because they felt that the color and the bright attitude of locomotives like this were absolutely essential to maintaining morale. So this was something that you projected to the public. So let's move forward. Here is an example. This is a 1867 locomotive, Northern Central Railway. There's this beautiful three-dimensional scroll work. Very time-consuming to put all this on. This is what people expected to see on a locomotive. This is a Rococo revival pattern that came into fashion in the 1830s and 40s. Was just continually spelled out. You can see this wonderful work all over here. This engine's thoroughly striped up. It's very nicely done. And here's our sandbox on the very same engine. This is outstanding. It took a long time to paint that. It took a very long time. And they're very proud of it. And we care. And you're varnishing annually for the last about four years. If you are building a lot of locomotives, and it looks like you're building even more locomotives the next year and the next year, so that by the time 1873 runs around, you're building 437 locomotives. You're going to have to start figuring out a more efficient means. But you can't make plain engines because the popular public you know, will not stand for that. Your clients will not stand for that. They have traditional expectations. So if you know anything about Style 1, the first part is it is using modern materials to meet traditional expectations. It's all about mass production. This engine, I call this Jersey Glam, because if you're going to test out a, 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 a new style that isn't fully approved with attitude, where do you test it out? You test it out in some Maryland, New Jersey. This is a hotshot railroad, the Camden and Atlantic. It goes from Camden, New Jersey, to the Atlantic coast. It carries people on vacations to the, you know, to the shore, to the Jersey Shore. This is the Jersey Shore, basically. And you know, we saw this engine last year. I just love this engine. Big, oh, no. big high driving wheels, big high wheels. You know, lots of details, and it's going to a place that has, you know experimental stick architecture beach bungalows are going to build like wooden elephants out there they're going to be building a lot of stuff so you can actually get away with testing out this new style and the style is very clear it has there you can see it there is a proto style one this is 1871 this locomotive was built and it's not yet fully <coughs> developed but all the elements are now coming into focus and the advantages of this is that it's two-dimensional. It can be put on with less skilled labor and less time. You can get an engine fully decorated in all the places we expect decoration, but it doesn't take as long to do. And if you're turning out a lot of engines, that is very efficient. One of the things, again, is that this is a, a pounce pattern. And so depending on the size of the tender, the striping pattern surrounded, which is freelance, you know, will adjust, and this will remain the same size. So keep, it, keep an eye on this pattern, because sometimes it's as big as this panel, sometimes it's a lot smaller. Arabesques are fantastic. They can fill up space, it's two-dimensional, it's very modern, it's being developed by 
a lot of new architects around there. Bill Henze, who designed these locomotives, would later get a house, a country house, by Frank Furness, who's one of the leading modernist architects in Philadelphia. And this building houses for guys like Scott, who was president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Cassatt gets a couple of uh, country houses from him. So all of the appropriate people are turning towards a style. Now, here is a style one locomotive, or at least this is one of the family of style one engines. It actually has some variations in a Baldwin catalog. This is a Sycamore <coughs> locomotive. It was built in 18, it was shown here in 1875. And you can see that now Baldwin is advertising this pattern. And that this pattern is becoming official. Because the scroll work is gradually phased out. Reno has the old fashioned scroll work. You know, it's a very traditional machine. Whereas now by 1874, 75, everything's gone to the new styles, you know, arabesques and flat decorations. It, here is a narrow gauge example, because Baldwin treated passenger engines the same regardless of the gauge. Now, narrow gauge, you may imagine narrow gauge to be really big, but come on, let's, let's look at this. Narrow gauge is the outer limits of railroad. Only the most purposeful attitudes will actually have a narrow gauge engine, a narrow gauge railroad. So it happens a lot in, in California and Nevada because they're, you know, they're being developed during the time that the narrow gauge boom is going. And Baldwin is very clever and fills in this um, market with nice, handsome engines that are designed to meet this, all the expectations using the same style as the big sister engines right there. And they look fantastic. But going back, going That's back one. Going oh, let's, let's just look at her for a moment. <laughs> this is an this is effect. Although this engine's narrow gauge, it does give you a pretty good idea of what a uh, you know, style one locomotive looks like in in service and at speed. Now, if you think that this is a beautiful sight, imagine that with 66 inch driving wheels. All right. This one. This one? This, this engine is built in Philadelphia's Centennial. This is one of Baldwin's display engines. See, Baldwin Locomotive Works written right there. Okay. This is not just an engine for someone. It is essentially style one. It's not quite, but it's essentially style one. But this is what they are showing at the most important fair of the decade. And this engine is in service. You can actually ride it on the Centennial Fairgrounds, along with all the other narrow gauge engines uh, it's providing service. Now, I gotta show you what a real locomotive looks like. This is a uh, Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore machine. Uh, this is number 56. Look at those driving wheels, isn't that great? This is really nice. I just think she's beautiful. She's not a style one, she's one of the family of style one engines. There's a few of them that had red wheels and they were always recorded as having a separate number for the wheel. So that means style 27, style 28, and so forth. There are three red wheel options with the centers, this little part right here, in say, dark wine, blue, green, depending on the roads. One of them was developed for Cuba, very typical. A lot of high passenger service when you have red wheels, but in black and white, it gives you a pretty good example of what style one passenger engines look like. And Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore was no slouch when it came to style. This engine ran on the Northeast Quarter. This is the Acela of 1875. Now, style one, you know, is not just restricted, it's not just for Baldwin. Although Baldwin develops it and pretty much, you know, is the only railroad company to actually use it. A few other locomotive builders are looking at what Baldwin is doing and taking in the influence. This is a Portland and Ogdensburg engine, number seven, built in 1874. It was ordered in 1872, uh, but it took two years to actually uh, finish the engine for some reason. But by the Portland Locomotive Works of Maine, Portland, Maine. And look at that. There you have the beautiful style one, you know, variations on the tender, and they just decided to you know, make their best pretty safe and they put in a little traditional scroll work. So you can see a lot of this style, type of stuff going on. They were also copying from William Mason. There's that shape of flange that was distinct to William Mason or Tom, Massachusetts. Now, as we head west, and I thought I'd rather, personally I would rather head west on a big Schenectady, uh, this is a big, nice 1875, 76 Schenectady. I think this is number 226. Look at those driving wheels. Those are great. And there's a big, you know, big coaches. This is a real railroad. And 
here we are going through, and we are going to now encounter a uh, pretty sensational experience. And this is this is the second thing that I want you to understand. Style one is not just an easy way to get a nice looking thing. It means something. You know, because when you get out west, here's something you're going to run into alongside um, those western depots and that, that big Schenectady would have passed. This is the uh, Palisade. The Eureka Palisade was owned by Mr. Darius Ogden Mills, who was an influence by who was involved. It had a fleet of no less than uh, five Style One locomotives. They ordered a Style One freighter as late as 1878, two years after Alden had dropped it for a more updated style. And you know, it had three freight engines, two passenger engines, all of them in style one with a sea level finish, which is appropriate for passenger. This is the Palisade, you've seen the Eureka, it's pretty remarkable. And this is the way these guys gave a great show whenever the big railroads came through. So what's this all about? Well, well why am I showing you a picture of Yosemite? This is a Alfred Bierstadt painting of Yosemite. Uh, this is, we're looking out, this is El Capitan right here, here in our sunset. You know, this is intensely romantic. Alfred Bierstadt was very good at this sort of heroic, romantic, you know, environment. And, you know, this sort of it pulls things out of the soul. It makes people, you know, swell with emotion. And, and it conjures up a kind of grandeur of, of scale. And I was thinking about this two days ago when I was driving on um, uh, this lonely highway from Benton to Lee Lining, and I was passing these huge mountains, magnificent scenery, and I thought, you know, Darius Hoffman Mills would have seen this type of stuff. You know, you know Henry Yarrington would have seen these types of things. We live in a pretty heroic environment. We live in a very heroic landscape. You know, that means, you know, we're kind of in a, we're in a new country. This is where nothing has ever been done before. And we're doing it not only as good as the East Coast, but, but better. You know, Yarrington writes, to the Detroit Car Works. He, you know, I don't know any, what, anything about this LA and Independence Railroad you're asking about, but here's some brochures of our stuff. This will show you how we do some things in this country. Yeah. That's, that's Yarrington. You know, he says, oh, those poor, slow guys back east. You know, what do they think of vlogging with a locomotive? You know, there's a great sense of power and ability. So if you take a look, who's, whose house is this? What is that? This is the private art gallery of Darius Ogden Hills. He owned this painting. He could see this every day. He had the full capacity and knowledge that he was engaged in an enterprise that no one had, you know, the scale that no one had ever done. Yarrington calls the Virginian Trucking Railroad the biggest little railroad on the face of the earth. These guys believe it, and they act accordingly. They're not engaged in just moving ore. They're moving silver ore, and they're moving so much that one of the big four can have a wife in Paris in this huge house wearing silk dresses that he visited once a year. That's the scale of this whole thing. So here we are. There's there's Yerry. I think this is Yarrington and Bliss, uh, Wayne Bliss, who runs this. They are engaged in all aspects of this enterprise. So they're building the you know, Ogden Mills is the uh, uh, financier of the Carson Tile when they're fluming. And so here we have this big yard of the wood that they cut, you know, connected to the railroad that they own, named for their surveyor. You know, they're standing on this is a great you know, idea of what they're capable of. And here you know, is a portrait of man of this destiny. This is the Carson City engine house. Here is a scale, and look at all these style one engines all just lined up. Here, up, oh, you know, 1876. This is October 1876. She's a year old. Already, she's got a couple of neat little pictures that have to show up. But look at the stone engine house. Who else has a stone engine house? You know, who else has so many splendid locomotives? And you know, who else is using a passenger style on freight engines, well, all the railroads in the West. That's just what you do. So let's take a look at these mobiles because the mobiles are finished very nicely. They got brass domes, they got some nice wrappers, they have a lot of 
really beautiful finish. And the thing which is really unique is, apart from the Western railroads, there are only four other freight engines in the entire United States that have style one paint schemes, and they all belong to the same railroad in Ohio. So this is really distinctive. This is a really absolutely phenomenal you know, detail that you are so big that you can haul your silver with a passenger engine. I mean, that's basically the thing. They're not hauling just any road, they're hauling silver ore. I think that's the, they are consciously telling you that that is what they're doing. So here is the bow curtain. Now, again, you know, it's not that unusual to have a nicely finished switch engine. Switch engines are the pets of the yard. There is one other style of one switching locomotive on the east side of the country. But this one is very popular. This one gets in a lot of press. It's described as very beautiful. You know, it's the boys have a lot of fun squirting shingles out of roofs with this fire hose. You know, it's always running back and forth. It's always having a good engine. You know, these little switch engines were very well taken care of. They had, you know, their um, tenders were about the size of a teacup, but they were still pretty spectacular. And so every detail of this locomotive was really nicely done. And here you can see some of the nice features of Style 1. Here you have a wine color driving wheel with a red center. And this was codified into the Style 1 system in February 1874. And here we have the tender. Now see how small the tender is in comparison to that big Camlin and Lanark engine? See how big this uh, uh, sensor is compared to the uh, size of the tender itself? You can sort of see that detail there. We have the bar. It's really pretty nice. Now, I want to uh, give you a couple color images. I am sorry to say that John uh, gave us those great pictures of the mobiles last year. has been so busy working on uh, car sim uh, that he's had to focus all of his time on that. Racing cars and Ferraris take up a lot of pixels. And they have an entire floors of people dedicated to producing these things for this particular product which is about to roll out. But he did have time to give us a, uh, an image of what I think is perhaps one of the most beautiful and perhaps one of the most important locomotives in the United States that survives today, the Inyo. Uh, the Inyo uh, is rather extraordinary as a passenger locomotive. She you know, is clearly a passenger engine. But, uh, in fact, she's a protective engine. But typical of, of the Virginia trucking, she's not just a protect engine. She's a protect engine for the protect engine. Now, how many railroads get that? You know, in case the Genoa breaks down, you have the Inyo. And you have this capacity of, well, we better get an extra just in case. You know, the traffic might pick up. we got to do something. So they use her for a lot of switching and things. They are not, uh, Earrington is very conscious of getting the most out of his dollars, not a spend grip. But he does make certain that they have this splendid passenger locomotive on hand. You know, the thing about Inyo, which is unlike any other surviving locomotive in the United States, is that there's only a handful of locomotives which have not been substantially rebuilt in their life. And those are all Virginia trucks. Of the engines that survive today, all the other engines have been heavily rebuilt. The, the, the Texas, the General, you know, the Chicago Northwestern, Fort Worth. Of those engines that survive today, only one of them that hasn't been substantially rebuilt has a traditional paint scheme completely known, and that is the Inyo. I'd like to show you what that paint scheme looks like. It's pretty nice. She was entirely wine color when she was in you know, Her frame, her wheels, her pilot, everything about her. She had the great style one sunbursts coming out from the driving wheels. She has the great, you know, these wonderful little uh, details. These diamond patterns had first appeared in the Moorish Pavilion of the 1867 Paris Exposition. And I've seen them on the wheels of fire engines operated by the Honolulu Steam and Fire Company. They were very, very popular. Because Inyo is a Virginian trucking passenger engine, she has a B1 finish. Now, most passenger finishes are C. The extreme end is, of course, the A finish, and you would leave that for the North Pacific Coast, which is going to go in over the cliff. Uh, but this particular engine has a B finish, which is really nice, but not crazy. And so we have this brass wrapper on the sandbox. There's no need 
to have that. Usually you leave brass wrappers and or planished iron wrappers for thermal surfaces like the cylinders. But having it up here is simply for looks. There's no historic you know, association. And that's just a degree of like the degree of show that you're going to find on the Inyo. And Inyo is exceptional as well because the heads are made of brass on the cylinders. Normally they are polished iron, even if the engine has brass wrappers. Inyo is, is substantial and very handsome. Here's an overall look. You can see the overall style. And here is the detail of the cab. She had a varnished walnut cab. She had a brass plate mounted right here with the letters Inyo. Up here you can see the builder's plate you know, recorded down here. And here is something nice feature. She has varnished wood twin boxes. And we've seen those on the builder's photograph of the JW Bowler. Here is our tender for the Inyo. You can see the multiple white and cream and red striping, you know, the great lettering, and all those features. No, no toolbox yet. That disappeared last night. 